This is Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Katie. Come on, if you love Pastor Katie, give it up for her. And uh, how are we doing? 11.30 a.m. service. We doing okay, everybody? Good to be with you. And uh, I love your pastors, Pastor Jason and Andrea, so much. They are dear friends. Uh, Pastor Jason's known me longer than I've known him. He knew me as a kid. And our families, we go way back together and um, just love him and his kids and uh, always an honor to be here. Feels like family and um, really, really just expectant. We had an incredible morning service at 10 a.m. God really just did something in people's lives. So I just want to encourage you today, wherever you're at today, whatever you came in facing, carrying, God wants to meet with you. Amen. Right where you are. So um, we've been in a series in the middle of messages uh, called Finding God. Pastor Jason told me, and the premise has really been simple. We're looking at places in the Bible where God uh, promises we can find him. So in other words, I wrote it this way, God desires to be found by you more than your desire to find him. Amen. Have you ever played hide and seek with a toddler? Anybody? The, when you play hide and seek with a toddler, you don't go hide somewhere that's really difficult. You hide in the most obvious place, right? Because the joy is a parent or an uncle or an aunt is not in making it difficult to be found, but it's the joy in making it easy to be found. God's the same way. God loves for us to uh, find him. And so uh, often our distance from God, Pastor Jason's taught us, uh, is within our control. That it's less God's absence, rather our lack of awareness of God's presence. So I know what you're thinking. If you're anything like me, why is it so challenging then to find God? And we've been using two images over the past couple of weeks to help us during this series. So they're going to put the first one up. It'll probably be familiar to you. But the norm for our society is a mixture of what? Distraction, addiction, and exhaustion. Can I get an amen? We're distracted because we're bored. We're addicted because we're coping. And we're exhausted because we're busy. And some of us, it's not busy by choice. It's just because life's busy. I mean, anyone ever woke up on a Monday morning and Monday asked you, do you want today to be a busy day or a not busy day? Don't you wish it did that? Life just happens to us. Um, and this is how we show up a lot of times with God. It's the condition of our soul, and it's when we attempt to connect with God's Spirit in this condition that often it can be difficult to find God. So instead, we've been using another image that they're going to put up on the screen to reframe the way we pursue God. And I love how Pastor Jason sent this to me, that grace is God initiating. Anyone remember week one of the series with Pastor Jason? Grace is God initiating. We're not having to earn or prove anything. It's he that is inviting us into, into a relationship. Effort, uh, it's our actions, our attempts to find him in attention. It's our perspective. We're looking for him. We're trying to see him in all the different ways that are present in our life. And I want to lean into one of these aspects today. But week one, we talked about seeking. God promised if we seek him, we'll find him. Uh, the next week, Pastor Joe taught on, we've, we've talked about helping, that God said that when we see uh, and when we help the hurting, we're actually helping him. Jesus said, uh, as you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. And last week, Pastor Jason talked about repentance that God meets us in our confession. So today, if you're taking notes, uh, I want to talk to you on rest, that God meets us in a place of rest. So uh, let's pray, if you would, with me all over the room. We just say, come Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. Thank you for every man, woman, boy and girl under the sound of my voice that is not here by accident today, but rather here on purpose. At my prayer today, that Spirit of God, you would meet them right where they are. A word in season to speak to the tired and to the weary. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Well, while preparing for this week, I realized that last time I spoke, something uh, pretty significant happened in my life. I married the woman of my dreams, everybody. And so we got a picture. 
My wife's name is Abby, and she wishes she could be here today, but this is us, downtown Raleigh, getting married. We got married on a Thursday night because it's cheaper. Can I get an amen, anybody? <laughs> and uh, we loved it, and we had a good time, and uh, we had a small wedding, and then, um, but man, she's incredible, and the best thing that's ever happened to me outside of Jesus, and uh, I love her so much, and we'll get her here on a weekend soon, um, but man, I left uh, North Carolina, I told them in the early gathering, um, when I left, it's kind of been similar to your weather the past couple of weeks, but for whatever reason, this past week, the Lord graced us with 75 degree sunny spring weather. So when I showed up yesterday, I was in a t-shirt. I walked outside, I froze to death. I was so cold. I said, man, so I wore a long sleeve today, but, um, but we're believing for warmer weather for Louisville. Can I get an amen? Um, I wish I could have brought it with me, but I thought I'd make you laugh this morning in church as we opened up and tell you a funny story about our honeymoon, because um, a few days after our wedding, Abby and I, we decided to fly into Cancun for a week. Isn't it funny how you just feel closer to God on the beach? Uh, you just let like the heavens open up, you hear the voice of God, and we went to the beach uh, for a week, and uh, we decided to fly out of Charlotte, because if, you've, uh, if, if you're familiar with North Carolina, Charlotte's here, and, and Raleigh's here, and while Raleigh's an amazing airport to fly out of and, and, and get to, you have to have layovers often in Charlotte. And those layovers can get delayed. So we really wanted a straight shot. So we flew out of Charlotte. So we drove down to Charlotte, spent the night. And I underestimated the next morning how long it would take to park. Um, the layout of Charlotte Airport's really interesting if you haven't been. The parking deck is so far away from the terminal. So you have to shuttle, unlike RDU or any other smaller airport, probably similar to here. And so we have to park that morning. We're having to hop on a shuttle. Abby's getting a little stressed. Now, this is day one of marriage. So, man, you understand. I'm, 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 I'm trying to act all cool like I got it together. But down inside, I'm getting a little panicked because I'm thinking, if we miss this flight to Cancun, we're, we're delayed. The resort's delayed. The check-in's delayed. We're going to lose the day. So I'm really trying to get us there. So we get inside the terminal, and I'm used to flying solo often by myself, so I just travel with the carry-on. I'm not a fan of checking baggage if you don't have to. But it hit me as we were getting there that my wife was coming on this trip with me, and my wife overpacks. Any husbands can relate? So she brought this large purple suitcase with her, and I've got this tiny little black carry-on. And we get to check the bag in it with American Airlines, and the employee's like, all right, we'll go ahead and load it. And for those of you that know, you have to go through the process of loading the bag to weigh it. And church, I'm here to tell you this morning that my wife's luggage was 15 pounds over limit as we were checking to get on this flight. Now, again, we're in a hurry. So the, 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 the limit's 50, and we're at 65. So the American Airlines employee, you know, looks at me and goes, sir, you know, no problem. You can pay either $100 and just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll send it through, or you can attempt to readjust. And I'm thinking to myself, absolutely, we'll pay the $100, no worries. And my wife looks at me, Abby, and if you know Abby, you know Abby. And Abby looks at me and says, absolutely not. Open your suitcase, Logan. Now, let me remind you, as we're starting, as I'm getting on my knees in the middle of this busy airport, and she starts throwing swimsuits and toiletry items and hairbrushes and blow dryers at me, and I'm, I'm trying to, I, I've got like two outfits in my suitcase. The majority of my suitcase is her stuff combined with her suitcase that's 65 pounds. And so um, she starts throwing all these items at me, and we'll set it up on the scale, and we're going to weigh it. And they're like, ah, 60 pounds. Got 10 more to go. And so we'll take it back off and open it back off. As the process started, we probably did this four to five times, I started to notice that my personal items had no, no place now in luggage, and I was forced to carry them. And so I'm, like, holding my shoes, and I'm holding my swim trunks, and I'm, like, holding a sweatshirt, and all her stuff now fits. And the lady's like, finally, you got it. You're at 50, thank God. So I told Abby, hey, for, for the sake of time, why don't you go get in that line to go through TSA, and I'll go to this other line across the airport to go through TSA so we can get through quicker and we'll get on our flight. The reason I tell you the story is as I'm walking or actually running across the airport while she's going through TSA, I, again, remind you, I've got all my stuff now in my hands. There, there is nowhere for my luggage now. My wife's luggage is in her luggage and is in my luggage. Where's my luggage? In my arms. So I have a pair of shoes as we're running across the airport. And as I'm running, apparently I drop one of my shoes in the airport, which, again, I only have a few pair. And I drop one of my shoes. As I'm running, I don't notice it. And as I'm hustling through the airport, I hear the voice of the American Airlines employee that was assisting us, the lady here. This is what I hear as I'm running. I hear, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. And I stop, and I'm like, what is going on? I turn around. She goes, oh, I'm sorry, sir. And so I nodded and picked up my shoe and considered lighting myself on fire right there in the airport as I made my way to TSA. But I got through that TSA line. I looked at Abby and said, you're not the only one with good hair in this relationship. Let me tell you that right now. So 
we made it through TSA, got on the flight, made it to Cancun, but I thought I'd make you laugh at the expense of me. So it's the year for long hair, man. Grow it out and uh, grab your care, pair of cowboy boots. But that's, that's marriage, is it not? And uh, flying with, with your wife. But be still and know that I am God. It's the passage in Psalm that many of us know that Pastor Jason asked me to speak out of the day that says, be still and know that I am God. God's implying that he is found in a place of rest. The phrase be still uses a Hebrew term which can be rendered as relax, let go, or stop. It implies an act of surrender or release of striving and hostility. So you could read it this way, um, relax and know that I am God. Let go and know that I am God. Stop striving and know that I am God. But have you ever thought to yourself, why can it be so hard to just do that? Why is it so hard to rest? Why is it so hard to relax? Why is it so hard to sit in an environment like this and nod our heads and say amen, but to actually experience this Monday through Saturday? Well, it sounds so simple, but I think we all would agree it's easier said than done. And this is often the reason why whenever you attempt to make space for God, all hell starts breaking loose. Uh, I, I just started 21 days of prayer and fasting with our church back in January, and it's so funny to me whenever someone really begins to pursue God and make space for God during the week and pray and fast, it's, like, it's just like all hell breaks loose and it becomes a fight. Why sometimes, church, does it feel like it's a fight to get alone with God? What if I were to tell you it is, that it is a fight, and that you're not alone? Because, church, reality is there's a war for your attention. You're at war today. And the end goal isn't just your attention, it's your soul. And in the digital age of distraction, there's a resistance that we all face, but a resistance that it only comes from the outside. It's a resistance that comes from within. It's been said that you're the sum total of your thoughts, that what we think about, we become. That whatever or whoever we give our attention to is ultimately the person we become. It's why over a period of time, the thoughts we think become the narratives we live by become the stories that we end up telling ourselves and giving the power to shaping our lives as of this very moment. This is why, if you hear anything I want you to hear today, our greatest battle as followers of Jesus is the war in our minds. That in order to enter a place of rest, we must first learn how to win the war within. It's why I've stopped teaching first Sabbath and rest and helping people to slow down and practice uh, eliminating, ruthlessly eliminating hurry from their life because what I begin to learn not only in my life but in others is the moment people slow down and actually begin to stop, the noise cranked up within and they didn't know how to navigate their own thought life. You ever been on a vacation where you came out of a season of busyness, hecticness and you're ready to get on vacation only to find once you got on vacation, slow down and actually started to get alone with yourself, you were miserable? Anyone else? and you suddenly wanted a vacation from your vacation, you're like, I'm ready to just go home and get busy again. Because often many of us don't know how to slow down long enough, consistently enough, to know how to navigate the resistance within. It's one of the reasons throughout the Gospels we see Jesus build a rhythm of continually withdrawing from the noise of the outside world to be alone with God through prayer, rest, listening to his voice. It's a practice in church, we often call solitude. What is solitude? Well, Ruth Haley Barton writes, solitude at its most basic, profound level is simply an opportunity to be ourselves with God. That for Jesus, solitude was more than a therapeutic, quiet place for the soul, but it was a place of encounter, a battlefield. That it was in solitude with God, Jesus fought the war within. And in Luke 4, we're given a glimpse of this following Jesus' baptism. He's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And there, at the end of 40 days of prayer and fasting, Jesus encounters the devil. And perhaps you're wondering, why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus in the wilderness to be tempted? Doesn't that seem a little odd? But could it be that the Holy Spirit was not leading Jesus into the wilderness to break him, but rather to reveal what was in him? That for 30 years of Jesus' life that are unrecorded, he had a daily relationship with the Father. And within those 30 years, an identity was set in place. That after 40 days of not eating, not drinking, in the wilderness, in the heat, 
Look, anyone ever, I'll, I'll be fasting for like a day and I'm ready to quit and give up and go back to food. Jesus is 40 days in. You go read the science of the condition his body was in. He was on the brink of death. Then the devil comes in his most tired, vulnerable state. And it's in solitude Jesus fought the war within. And it's there too we must learn how to fight our war within. I almost titled this message this morning, Talking Back. But for the next few moments, I want to give you three observations from Jesus' time in the wilderness of how we too can win our war within in order that we might find rest for our souls. Because Matthew 11, the famous invitation of Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. And I believe today that for the heart and not only the soul of this church, but for your life, is for you to enter a rest that's not only physical but mental. And that of the abundant mental place of rest in your life, regardless of what's going around around you, but because of what's in you, God will call you to be a non-anxious presence in your life and in your family. So three observations if you're taking notes. And the first is this. As we enter solitude and begin to create space to be alone with God and rest, we will encounter ourself. That the first person you will encounter is yourself. I heard an older, wiser man by the name of Tommy Briggs. He, was a, he is a mentor to me. He's 86 years old, but he gets around like he's 20. He once told me one time, he said, Logan, there's three voices you're going to have to navigate always in your life. It's God's voice, the devil's voice, and your own voice. But this is the catch. He said, I don't know what's worse, your voice or the devil's. Anyone understand that? In Mark's account, Jesus' is temptation of the wilderness, uh, Mark records the same thing Luke does. But I love how he phrases it. The Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals or the wild beast. Notice when Jesus enters the wilderness, he had to face the wild beast, as do you and I have to face our inner beast, our inner demons. And the reason many of us fill our lives with noise and crowds and entertainments and the constant scrolling of social media and Netflix binging isn't because we're content or happy. We're just afraid. Afraid of what? To come face to face with the reality of our true condition and our true self. Because it's really a lot easier to just come home and watch Netflix or be busy than to have to accept the condition of not only my soul but our marriage or our kids and our family or our church. Because in facing ourselves, we must what? Face our pain. So I often in seasons of my life, even as a pastor, I've intentionally been busy. That in the seasons I've been burned out, it wasn't by accident, it was by choice. Because I learned that even using spiritual activities to distract myself from the inner reality of the greater pain within. Or as Pete Scazzaro once said, using God to avoid God. That's why it's so much easier to quote a scripture or come to church or fill your life with worship music when God really wants to talk to you about what's really going on in your soul. Good news, though, is that on the other side of the fear of facing ourselves is freedom. Not shame, not condemnation, not legalism. God does not call you and I into the light to harm us, but to heal us. But God cannot heal who we pretend to be. And for some, God is inviting you and I in on a journey today to come to him as we truly are. To become still, long and honest, long enough to allow his love to bring healing and freedom to the deepest places of pain in our soul. And I sense the Holy Spirit want me to share this in the early gathering, and I sense he wants me to share it to someone here today. But you don't have to be afraid. Don't got to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid that because Deep within the uncharted waters of your soul, there's a love there. And we'll find God there in ways we never thought possible. And Ruth Haley Barton once said that God is often waiting on the outside of the noise and chaos of our our everyday lives. There's a book I recently read by a friend that you may or may not have heard of. I highly recommend it. It's called Deep Change. And um, best resource I can think of to help you further walk this journey out of inner healing, but I once heard it asked this way, and you could write this down to reflect on in your own time with God. What if the quiet that we so fear holds the secret of our freedom? What if it holds the secret? What if on the other side of that 
pain, that reality you're afraid of facing is an opportunity to step into becoming everything God's called you to be. But secondly, not only do we encounter ourselves, we encounter the devil. According to Jesus, there is a devil. John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was much a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and he's the father of all lives. The devil has one agenda and it's to bring destruction to all that is good and true. He's an agent of chaos and if you hear anything about the devil today, hear this, he's a liar. He's a liar. And his primary tactic and means are lies. And you'll look and notice in Genesis 3, he came to Eve with an idea. And he'll never lie to you about the things that are obvious. He'll lie to you about the things that are 90% true, but he'll twist that 10% to speak into an area of your life to bring an idea where you are the most inflicted with pain. And we see this demonstrated not only in Genesis 3, but notice Immediately following the baptism, the devil comes to Jesus with three ideas, three temptations, all questioning the very thing that God the Father had previously spoken over him in his baptism, which was, this is my son, whom I love and am well pleased. But notice that every idea and temptation of the devil began with a question, if you really are the son of God. That the devil will always speak and bring an idea to you about your identity. Why is this? Because who or what sets your identity will demand your allegiance, flood your mind, and take priority in your life. That will be your functional God. Who are you looking to to define you? Your bank account? Your spouse? your article of clothing, your material items, the kind of car or truck you drive, the political party you're affiliated with, who's in office. To what or whom do you look for a source of validation, affirmation, and security? Because that might be your functional God. And Henry Nguyen writes the five lies of identity are, maybe you'll resonate with one of these because you hear this in your own intrusive thoughts. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what other people say or think of me. I am nothing more than my worst moment, or I'm nothing less than my best moment. May I ask you what lie or idea about God are you believing today that has not only shaped your view of yourself, but how you're living? And notice Jesus' fight with the devil is less this dramatic scene, but rather a quiet conversation in his mind between the truth of God's word and the lie of the enemy. That a desert father wrote a book called Talking Back, a monastic handbook for combating demons. He often would go into the wilderness to fight demons, as so you and I do often on a daily basis. And in it, he made the point that Jesus refused to get sucked into debate or dialogue with the devil. Rather, when the lies of the evil one came into his mind, he just changed the channel. And he redirected his attention to the truth of Scripture. That was Jesus' strategy. There was no prayer meeting. There was no intense volume level of prayer. There was no oil. There was no church service. There was no call to intercessor, intercessors. He changed the channel. He redirected his attention to God's truth. Jesus exuded a quiet confidence in God's love, which leads us, as we begin to close this morning, to what is truth? What is reality then? How do I know what's true and what's not in my mind? How do I know what is a lie and what's the truest about me? Which leads us to our last encounter. Because not only will we encounter ourselves and not only will we encounter the devil, we'll encounter God. And some people in the room today, you have been so bombarded with intrusive lies and narratives and ideas of the enemy that some of you have come into an agreement with, which that's all he needs you to do, by the way. Because the moment Eve came into an agreement with the idea that God wasn't who he said that he was and she wasn't who God said she was, that was all the devil needed to have the power to not only enter into Eve and Adam, but to thwart the entire human race from that point on. It was an agreement with a lie and an idea. It was an illusion. And there's people here today that the devil is behind smoke screens and mirrors and you're living in an illusion that appears to be reality, but it's not reality. So how do I fill my mind with reality? 
Well, good news, truth is a person. John uh, 1.14, and the word became flesh. John 14.6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the what? The truth and the life. That the Son comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 8, 31 through 32, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not know it as information, but a person. That's why some of you in the room think to yourself, I know scripture and I quote scripture, but I don't feel set free, because it's not just about knowing a verse, it's about knowing the person in the scriptures. It's about knowing him, and when I know him, and I allow the narrative of my life to be changed and filled by the Holy Spirit, then and there I'm able to enter into freedom. To know truth is to know a person. So is it possible, Logan, you're telling me, that I can come to church, memorize scripture, say a prayer, and not encounter a person named Jesus? Yes. Look at Judas. Judas was in the presence of Jesus, but he wasn't known by Jesus. And there's people here today that say, if I could just see Jesus and see a sign and see a miracle, it wouldn't change anything for you. There were people that walked with Jesus, close to Jesus, that still were not known by Jesus and still missed Jesus. The Hebrew word for know found in Psalm 46.10 that we read earlier, be still and know that I am God, that word know translates to intimacy. It's the same know that in Genesis it says Adam knew his wife Eve and a type of intimacy passionate marriage covenant between a man and a woman. I love how intimacy once was phrased by, um, I can't think of his name, Dr. Henry Cloud, into me you see. That, that intimacy you have in a marriage with your spouse that goes beyond physical but to soul level intimacy that says I see into you who you really are. God is saying that is what I want with you. Allow me to see into you and know that I am God. Allow me to see who you really are, but even better than this, this person speaks. Truth not only is a person, but it's a person that speaks. I think one of the greatest ideas or lies or misconceptions among Christians today is that God doesn't speak or I cannot hear the voice of God. But can I tell you today, it's a lie from the pits of hell. That John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. How do I learn to hear God, Logan? We learn his nature. That when I learn God's character, I'll recognize his voice. And there's people here today that you've believed a lie that I've never heard God. Could it be that it's not that you can't hear God or that God's not speaking? You've just not learned his voice. That if we were to leave service today and we were to be in the parking lot and I were to call your name, you might not recognize me. But if your wife or spouse or husband or kid or family member or best friend called your name, you'd recognize it. Why? Because you know their voice. You know them. I believe God is speaking to men and women today in the midst of the chaos and noise of your life. And some of you feel distant and far from God. But today you're learning his character. And you're learning what it's like. And if you can still, if you, if you can become still and honest long enough, you're going to find God in a place of rest. That when the noise and the resistance within, I can learn to begin to talk back. And I can begin to fight back to the resistance of the war within and redirect my attention to reality. I'm going to begin to hear God in ways I've never heard this year. But how is one of the primary ways I know God? By reading his word. Church, there's nothing more perfect, true, and pure on this side of eternity than this book. According to Timothy, it's all God-breathed, Old Testament to New, and it is all pointing to what? A person. That the goal of this book is not to read this book for information, but transformation. This is a book that I don't read, it reads me. It's a book that in this book, as I spend time with the Holy Spirit, it points me to the person of Jesus. Jesus said in John 8, you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life. But what did Jesus say? They bear witness about me. On the road to Emmaus, what was Jesus teaching these two men about Moses and the law? He was showing them, I'm in the Old Testament, and it's all been pointing to me. And the goal of reading scripture is not information but transformation when I allow the spirit of Jesus to take this book and allow it to become all the more real to me. That every time I open up the pages of this book, there's men and there's women today that love scripture and they know scripture but they don't love Jesus. 
I can know scripture and quote scripture, but it's not in the knowledge that I have. It's in the spirit of God in me that the same Jesus of Nazareth that walked these pages lives in me. His temple is in me. His spirit lives in me. There's an incredible study that was done um, by understanding the Bible Engagement Challenge. Um, you can go read it. They'll have the stats on screen and the source. But 40,000 people ages to 8 to 80 read the Bible not once, twice, three times a week. They had to read it four times a week. And these were the, statistic, um, the, the statistics that came from this study. Feeling lonely dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Sex outside of marriage dropped 68. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. Sharing your faith jumped 200%. And discipling others jumped 230%. All by meeting with the person of Jesus in this book four days a week. It's the power of God's word. Backed by science. So where do I start? Because this is overwhelming. I just led a girl named Melanie to Jesus. Um, incredible Zoom call. Uh, paralyzed by anxiety and fear. Panic attacks. Was about to go into an institution. Someone in our church began to reach out to her. Pray with her. We got on a Zoom call. She was so in fear and panic. She couldn't leave her house. I led her to Jesus on a phone call. And she's in our church back in Raleigh this morning. And you know what's changed her life? I talked to the girl that invited her that's in our group. She said, I talked to Melody the other day on the phone. She's going through the Bible. She can't get enough. She's a different person, Logan. One week, medication, all medications, about to go into an institution. My point is this. There's power in God's word because it's a living word. I told Melanie, she said, where do I start? I said, you got to get a Bible, Melanie. We got her a Bible. I got a new Bible this year. Abby, my wife, and I were going through the Bible in one year. I wanted a new Bible to mark it up. You know, if you're, if you're needing a plan, Pastor Jason's got so many great resources. You go to YouVersion, the Bible app, it's free. You can pick any translation you want. People ask me, what's the best translation? I say the one that you read and like and understand. Can I get an amen? Find that translation and, and get into God's word because over time, you practically begin to make space to fill your mind and give your attention to God's word, to discover who God is and who he says that you are. And a long time ago, I came across something that we handed out in the early gathering. They'll give it to you on your way out if you'd like. But it was a little card with God's voice versus Satan's voice. And anytime I had a thought or a lie or an area in my life that I wanted to filter through, this helped show me the nature of God. And they're going to put it up on the screen for you today. God's voice will steal you while the devil's voice will rush you. God's voice leads you while Satan's voice pushes you. God's voice reassures you while Satan's voice frightens you. God's voice enlightens you while Satan's voice confuses you. God's voice will encourage you while Satan's voice will discourage you. God's voice will comfort you while Satan's voice will worry you. It's God's voice that will calm you. But Satan's voice obsesses you and God's voice convicts you. But it's Satan's voice that condemns you. And as Eddie comes to the keys and we close, according to C.S. Lewis, the devil's primary way of wrecking a love relationship with God, church, I want you to hear me this morning, is simply this, condemnation. Shame. There's people in this room today, you, the, the last place you wanted to be was church because you're anticipating being condemned. And the idea of being alone with God, and if God does speak and he will talk to me, he's going to tell me everything that's wrong about me. How do I know the difference between conviction and condemnation? Aren't they the same? Well, my dad told me, he said, son, condemnation says this is what's wrong with you. You're broken. You're messed up. There's no hope. Conviction is the loving hand of a heavenly father on your shoulder that says, son, there's a better way. There's a better way. That's not who you are. It's not who you are. There's a better way. Why don't you believe the voice of the Holy Spirit? Listen to the voice of truth. What is God like? You sum it up for me, Logan, in a word. Love. John 4, 15. This is the basis of our theology of God. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God, so that we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, that God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. This is where we begin knowing God and learn how to enter rest, to let go and relax in his love for us. 
And I'll close with this statement. And here, Henry Nouwen wrote in a book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. He said, for most of my life, I've struggled to find God. Anyone else? To know God, to love God. I've tried hard to follow the guidelines of the spiritual life, pray always, work for others, read the scriptures, to avoid the many temptations that will try to come destroy my life. And I failed many times, but I always tried again, even when I was close to despair. But now I wonder whether I have sufficiently realized that during all this time, God's been trying to find me, to know me, to love me. The question's not, how am I to find God, but how am I to let myself be found by God? The question's not, how am I to know God, but how am I let, to let myself be known by God? And finally, the question this morning, Hope City, is not how am I to love God, but how am I to let myself be loved by God? That God is looking into the distance for me, trying to find me, longing to bring me home. Because one moment in the presence of God, one moment in the loving presence of a heavenly Father that can look into you and tell you the thing that is the most truest about you will do in a moment what religion cannot do in a lifetime. It'll do in a moment what therapy cannot do in a lifetime. It'll do in a moment what self-effort and striving and daily trying will not do. Because only the one that made you can define you. And only the one that created you can tell you who you are. And only the one that sustains you in your mother's womb can come along and tell you the truest thing about you, which says, sir, you're not defined by your bank account and your income and your job status, nor mother are you defined by appearance or what others say about you. Or to the child today or the teenager, the high school or the middle school that says, I feel like I'm defined by so many things but it's the voice of a heavenly father today that's coming and saying, I know who you are. And I have a word, and it's a better word being spoken over you. And as we stand and close all over the room this morning, I felt led to just be vulnerable and share with you, one, where this is coming from, but two, a, a moment where God met me recently because I got married in November. At the end of the year, our church is going through an incredible transition right now where we inherited a church four years ago that's been around for 30 years. It's been a lot of work through a pandemic and an election, and God help us in another election this year. And um, Not the time to be a pastor, if you're looking, I promise. Do, do anything else in the world right now than, than that. But, but it's, it's a lot of work, and toward the end of the year, I, just, I begin to deal with a lot of warfare within my mind. It's just like the, the knob got turned up. The stress went up. Anxiety went up, and I knew there was a lot of constants changing in my life, a lot of responsibility. But it was interesting because it's, it, it's as if God was, uh, or the, the lies of the enemy, the intrusive thoughts, weren't so much about my job or my role or our church or my family or my wife or my friends, but it was about me. It's like the devil was beginning to talk about me. And then I had my own inner critic, which that plus the devil is a disaster waiting to happen. And as I came to the end of the year, God began to talk to me about what I'm talking to you about today. I've been preaching this to myself for months now. That's why I'm so passionate about it. And as I got to the end of the year, I, uh, I was like, you know, I preached this to our church as we began 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I wish I could tell you after preaching it, it's like things subsided. But man, things got worse. <laughs> it's like the voice it got louder and the noise got louder and talking to Abby about it and I said man I just feel like I'm getting beat up and she's like well Logan you're carrying a lot and our team we begin to realign some things and I've been trying to rest and you know just really spend time with God but really listen to the voice of God and it was so funny last week I was sitting there on a Thursday night um, watching Yellowstone can I get an amen to all the men in the room and, um, and I was eating some deep dish pizza and just trying to escape from the week. I had a rough week. And um, as I was sitting there, I was watching it. And Abby was going out with friends. And I was watching this episode. And if you don't know Yellowstone, I'm not telling you to go watch it. But, um, but, but all the men in the room, I know you know. And John Dutton, who owns a ranch, has a son named Casey. And he's they're out riding horses one day. And he's been trying to talk to Casey about becoming the livestock commissioner for Montana so they can keep reins on this ranch and this property. Because people are coming to try to take it from them. Casey keeps pushing back, and Dad, I just, 
I don't want to do that. You know, that's not me, Dad. Ask, ask my brother Jamie. He's the politician who comes to a moment where John Dutton finally has to go a different direction, and it's just the two of them alone out riding one day in the field. And Casey speaks up, who you can tell feels embarrassed as if he's disappointed his dad. He says, Dad, I, uh, I'm sorry about what you wanted me to do, and I'm, I'm sorry I... Sorry I couldn't do that for you. That's just not, that's just not me, Dad. That's not just who I am. I'm, I'm not a politician, Dad. And he drops his head, and John Dutton, his dad, looks over at him on the horse across the field, and he looks at me, and he says, Son, I know exactly who you are. And don't you ever apologize for being it. And in the weirdest way, I don't know if it was the deep dish pizza or the emotions I felt from the week but it's like the presence of God came into that room and God anointed John Dutton, Kevin Costner and it's like I felt the presence of God come into the room and look at me in the eyes and say Logan son I know exactly who you are don't you ever Those places in you that you feel shame. Those areas where the devil's been talking to you. Those areas where your inner critic's been accusing you. I know who you are. Don't you ever apologize for it. I didn't say this in the early gathering, but I feel led to say it. Um, There's a verse that I don't have it on the screen for you, but it's at the end of that. Some of you are asking, how does it end with Jesus and the devil? Well, he, he wins. He overcomes every idea and every lie. And you know what it says? It said Jesus returned from the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the best part. And it said that the devil departed from him for a time. And I'm prophetically speaking this morning over this house and over the men and women in this house and this leadership. I want you to receive this as a word. When you return out of this wilderness season that you're fighting, in your mind, and your life, you're going to come out of it. And not only are you going to come out of it, you're going to come out of it not weaker, but stronger in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm declaring that the devil must depart from you for a time. He'll come back. He always does. He'll come back. He'll wait. He'll look for the next moment, but he's going to depart. And I speak that over this church. Speak it over your life. May the devil depart from you for a time. And may you return in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you return, may you know I am God's son with whom he loves and is well pleased. And as Zachariah said, it is not by might and it is not by power, but it is by the Spirit, says the Lord. We're going to listen to the voice of the Spirit, church. You're going to come out of this season. You're going to come out of it stronger and better. God's going to help you. But Jesus coming out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit wasn't just about him. It was about the ministry he was about to begin. You want to know why the devil's speaking so hard to some of you? You want to know why he's talking to you? Because he's intimidated by you. He knows who you are. He knows what's in you. He's ruthless. He's, he, he, oh, there's no good in him. He's, he's not, he desires nothing but death and destruction. But I know this. If he's talking to you, it's because you're a threat. And if he ain't talking to you, he ain't losing sleep over you. I'm sorry, but I feel led. I just want to share one more thing that I feel like talked to Tommy Briggs, that same guy told me the story earlier. He said, Logan, I asked him, I said, hey, I said, will, will, the, will the noise in your head ever get better? Like, do you ever just graduate to a place in your faith where it's like the devil leaves you alone? Like, I know he departs, and you know, that it's not like you live in constant warfare, but like, does the noise internally ever stop to where you just mature past that? And he's 86 years old, he's been following Jesus decades, and he said, Logan, I woke up this morning, and I heard a voice that said, you're going to die today. You're going to die today. And Logan, at 86 years old, with my wife in heaven and my kids, after following Jesus all these years, I had a choice. 
to either tune out the noise and redirect the channel or believe the voice of God. And he's still alive today. He said, devil, you're a liar. You've always been a liar. And this is my, this is my point. It doesn't ever go away, but it does get easier. And there's someone today like, yeah, but Logan, I've heard this all before, and I just don't know if it's ever going to get easier. I'm telling you, God's going to give victory today to somebody. And what seems like an overwhelming sense of noise now, it's just going to be an echo in a season of your life coming. (laughs) So I want to pray for you right now all over the room.